Designing an e-commerce system like Amazon is a complex challenge due to the vast array of services required in a production environment. However, given the time constraints of a technical interview, it's critical to ask the interviewer what functionalities are expected. In this solution, we're going to focus on the core user-facing features, such as product browsing, shopping cart, and order processing that most interviewers will prioritize. So let's jump in. So for the functional requirements, we'll obviously need user authentication to enable login, cart persistence, and order history. We'll need a product catalog, so this will allow browsing by category and searching by keyword with key details such as price and availability. We we'll also need a shopping cart, so support adding, updating, removing items and persisting them for logged in users. We'll need order management, so facilitating order placement, history and status tracking, as well as payment processing. So we want to support multiple payment methods and refunds securely. And finally, we'll want inventory management. So we want to ensure real time stock updates where it's reduced when an order is placed and increased when an order is returned. For the non-functional requirements, we'll want scalability, so we want to handle millions of users and transactions and be able to support traffic spikes at times like Black Friday sales. We'll also want low latency for search and page loads, ideally under 200 milliseconds, and fast checkout processes to minimize cart abandonment. And then finally, we'll also want availability, so the system should be reliably accessible at all times with minimal downtime. It's important to note that the following features are typical in a production e-commerce system, but they are excluded here due to the interview time constraints. So this will include notifications, so email and SMS updates for orders and promotions. However, there's a full notification system design linked in the description reviews and ratings. So these are user generated product feedback, very important, but not critical flows within this system design and also seller portals. So tools for third party sellers to manage their listings. Again, critical for a platform like Amazon, but not critical for the flows we're going to be looking at. And that's why it's so important to first clarify with your interviewer, what is the core functionality they want to see covered. So next we're going to look at some estimates. So we're going to look at queries per second and storage requirements for this e-commerce system. And we're going to use some simplified back of the envelope calculations, similar to what's expected in an interview. So for queries per second, we can assume that we've got 10 million daily active users with a peak traffic of two times the average. For the traffic breakdown, we can say most people just browse and search. So that could be 80% of the queries while then some are checkout. So let's say 20%. And so then for our calculation, we've got 10 million daily active users. And let's say on average, there's 10 page views per user. So that means we've got 100 million views per day. And then per second, we divide that by the number of seconds in the day, which gives us roughly 1,150 queries per second average. And then for the peak queries per second, we simply multiply that by two, which will give us a rough estimate of 2,300 queries per second. And again, these are simplified estimates for interview brevity, a more comprehensive analysis, for example, splitting QPS by operation and factoring and replication is more accurate, but omitted here due to time constraints in the interview. Next, we'll look at storage requirements. So again, we've got 10 million users, we can assume 100 million products and 1 million orders per day with one year retention. So for the calculation, we can say for users, we've got 10 million users, and each user might have a kilobyte of data. So that's 10 gigabytes of data for users for products, let's say we've got 100 million products. And then for each product, we've got 10 kilobytes of data per product. So this will give us one terabyte of product data. For orders, let's say we've got 1 million orders a day, we've got five kilobytes of data per order, and then we've got 365 days in the year. So that's 1.825 terabytes. And then finally, the total. So we just add those up. So we got the users, products, and orders data, which will give us roughly 2.84 terabytes. And again, these are simplified estimates. The numbers are very rough. Again, it's not so much the numbers that are important. It's more the process itself of getting to these numbers that they'll be interested in. And then finally, making sure our system can handle these requirements. So looking at the data model here, so this encapsulates the core entities required to support the e-commerce system design functionality. And it's designed to be simple yet extensible for an interview setting. So obviously in a production setting, you'll have a lot more tables here. We're just focusing on three core flows. So the main tables we've included are the user. So that'll support authentication, personalization. We have the product table. So this will store all the catalog data. We'll have the inventory. So this will be used for stock management and it's a separate table from the products. We'll also have cart and cart item tables. So this is for user shopping cart tracking. And then we'll also have order and order items, which is used for order details and inventory linking. And then finally, we'll also have the payment table, which will hold transaction details and tracking. So looking at the API design, so we've got some core RESTful endpoints that can be used in the e-commerce system design. And so we're going to focus on the main user flows again, that will be expected in an interview. And all these endpoints assume that there's secure communication. So HTTPS and user authentication via token, for example, adjacent web token in the authorization header. So the first endpoint will be the post to the auth login. Of course, this will just authenticate the user. We'll also need a get endpoint for the product. So this will be for searching with query parameter filters. And so this will just list products with filters. Next, we'll have a post endpoint for cart items. So this will simply add an item to a cart. And then we'll also have a similar one for orders. 
So we'll have a post request, which will simply place an order. And then finally, we'll also have a post request for a to pay for a specific order. And this will simply process a payment for the user. So again, in a production system, you'll have a lot more endpoints, but these five endpoints are pretty robust and we'll cover the main flows we're looking at. So the first flow we'll look at is the product browsing flow. So firstly, a user will send a request to browse products via the get products endpoint. The API gateway will receive the request, authenticate the user, apply rate limiting, and forward the request to the product service. And again, the API will be used for authentication and authorization via the JSON web token. It'll do rate limiting to prevent abuse by limiting the number of requests per user and it'll also have load balancing so it'll distribute requests across multiple instances of the product service using maybe a round robin approach for optimal load distribution the product service will first query an elasticsearch index for product metadata and elasticsearch is used due to the full text search capability the typo tolerance and low latency, as well as the horizontal scalability, which will be able to handle the millions of products that our site will hold. And we could also have Redis, and so this could cache frequently access product metadata. And as it's read heavy, we could have maybe a short time to live, TTL of maybe five minutes. And so this would reduce latency and reduce the load on Elasticsearch as well. Next, the product service will then reach out to the inventory service, which will check the stock count of such items, and it will get that from the inventory database. So we'll need to utilize a strong, consistent store. So we could use Cassandra with lightweight transactions. We could use PostgreSQL or Redis locks to prevent overselling and ensure atomicity, especially during critical high traffic periods. Uh, and I think Cassandra is a great option here with its blend of high write performance, horizontal scalability, tunable consistency, and built-in atomicity via uh, lightweight transactions, which make it an ideal choice for this inventory service. It excels in high traffic write heavy scenarios, ensuring that stock accuracy without sacrificing availability. So it's a perfect for a robust kind of e-commerce browsing flow. And then finally, the product service will then aggregate the search results from the Elasticsearch and Redis, as well as the stock data from the inventory service, and then it'll return the products to the user. The next flow will be the cart management flow. So as always, the user will add a product via the post cart items endpoint. The API gateway will receive the request, authenticate the user and apply rate limiting and then forward it to the cart service. The cart service will first reach out to the inventory service and the inventory service will then check that there is sufficient quantities available of that item. And so if it's insufficient, the cart service can simply return error saying there's insufficient stock. Next, the cart service can reach out to the cart database. And I think DynamoDB is a good choice here because of the single digit millisecond latency, the auto scaling capability is suitable for millions of concurrent carts, and the eventual consistency is acceptable for, for cart updates as it's a non-critical flow. And then you could also again utilize Redish to cache users cart data for quick retrieval. And so again, this would reduce the load on DynamoDB. And then given that there's frequent updates, I think maybe a longer TTL of maybe 24 hours is appropriate here. And then finally, it will return a response to the user saying, you know, the item has been successfully added. And then we We'll also be able to support put and delete operations to both update and remove items from the cart. Next, we have the checkout and order placement flow. So again, a user will initiate a checkout by the post orders endpoint. Again, the gateway will route this to the order service. The order service will first reach out to the cart database and cache to retrieve the user's cart items. It'll then reach out to the inventory service, which will then pull the data, which will then check the Cassandra database to make sure that there is enough in stock. And if there's insufficient stock, it'll simply return an error. And then finally, it will then call the payment service. And then it'll be up to the payment service to then successfully execute the payment. And so so in this system design, again, the payment service is a whole other system design. So we're just going to use a third party payments provider, in this case, Stripe. And so we're using this for, for secure transactions and to support multiple payment methods, as well as to effectively handle refunds. Once the payment is complete, the payment service will then place a message on a queue. So something like Kafka, which will then be picked up by a worker asynchronously. And so this will then firstly save the order to the orders database. And I think PostgreSQL, given its asset compliance, relational model and transactional consistency and durability, make it a great choice for the order database as it will ensure order data is accurate, queryable and resilient, which are key requirements for an e-commerce systems checkout flow, especially under pressure during times like Black Friday. While alternatives like DynamoDB or Cassandra excel in other areas, PostgreSQL strength aligns perfectly what we need for this order database. Once that's been saved, the worker can then finally reach out to the inventory to finalize the reserve stock deduction is atomically applied through to the inventory database. And so then finally, after the successful processing, the order service can then return a successful response to the user saying the order has been successfully executed. And finally, 
here we've got the complete architecture. I think it's always nice to have a snapshot of what the complete architecture looks like. Again, this is just to support the three main flows that we've outlined in this system design. In our production system, there'd be a lot more, but hopefully this will be enough to get you through most interviews. It's quite detailed, but given the time constraints of an interview, this should be more than enough to get you through. And then for additional discussion points, you could go deeper on security and compliance. So you could discuss secure auth authentication, so JSON Web Token or OAuth. So this ensures users securely authenticate using standard methods like JSON Web Tokens or OAuth protocols, enhancing security by delegating credential management to trusted providers. You could also discuss encryption at rest and transit, so HTTPS, TLS as well as PCI DDS compliance. So this is adhering to the payment card industry data security standard. And this will ensure that sensitive payment information is stored, processed and transmitted securely, reducing the risk of financial fraud or data breaches. But obviously we're using Stripe in this case, who will handle all that for us. You could also discuss load balancing and security. So you could discuss things like round robin or consistent hashing. As well as that, you could discuss maybe the use of Kubernetes or AWS ECS auto scaling if you wanted to kind of dive deeper into the tech being used. And so this could dynamically adjust resources allocation based on demand, ensuring optimal performance and cost efficiency during traffic fluctuations. And then you could also as well discuss horizontal sharding for databases. So distributing database data horizontally across multiple servers to scale capacity and performance, you know, and this will reduce latency uh, and handling large volumes of a data efficiently. You could also discuss error handling and reliability. So you could talk about circuit breakers for external services. So this is a mechanism to automatically halt calls to failing external services, preventing cascading failures and allowing systems to gracefully degrade when dependencies become unreliable. And then you could also mention item potency keys for payments and orders. So these would be unique keys included with requests to ensure operations such as payments or order submissions can safely retry without unintended duplicate actions, improving reliability and consistency. And then finally, you could also discuss monitoring and logging. So for metrics, using something like Prometheus or Datadog. Uh, for centralized logging, so you could use ELK, so Elasticsearch, Log Slash Cabana, or CloudWatch. And then for alerting, you could use something like PagerDuty. So this could enable rapid incident response by immediately notifying on-call engineers or teams when critical issues occur. So that's the full system design. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe. It helps the channel out a lot. If you want to see the full write-up, it's over at techprep.app. And hopefully, I will see you in the next one.